it's pretty common that I see patients sometimes in their 60s, 70s, who I'm the first doctor they've ever seen. Dr. Peter Bayich, how are you doing, my friend? I'm really good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you um, and have everyone get exposed to an amazing specialty, a subspecialty of urology, talking about men's health. Uh, a disclaimer that you gave me for everyone watching is you are on call, so <laughs> we, we may get to see medicine happen in real time. You may get called away if you get paged or uh, whatever the, the fancy new version of paging is, if, if they have that anymore. Um, so we, we will uh, have a fun conversation and, and hopefully... Nobody steals you away from us during this hour. So <laughs> thanks for taking some time to hang out with us. Yeah, of course. So yeah, let's yeah. talk about men's health. When when a urologist says, I'm a men's health specialist, what does that look like? Yeah, so uh, essentially the primary things we focus on are men's sexual and urinary health. So we treat a lot of erectile dysfunction, BPH, low testosterone, Peyronie's disease, uh, many of us also treat male infertility. So it's really um, an area of benign urology, although many of us also see, you know, routine uh, consults for things like elevated PSA and hematuria and things like that. Interesting. How did you get involved in this world? You want me to go way back? <laughs> <laughs> way back. No, I don't have to go super way back. Uh, obviously, you were interested enough in a surgical sp subspecialty to want to get involved in the urology world. What yeah. What was it about men's health that they were like, oh, that's that's the, the urology that I want to focus on? Yeah, you know, we where I did my residency, which is kind of when I decided what I ultimately wanted to do, we did a lot, as, as many major academic centers do, we did a lot of big cancer surgery, you know, bladder removal, prostate removal, et cetera. And um, what I found was that many of the patients that underwent these big surgeries had some negative uh, effects of those with respect to their quality of life. So how it might have, you know, led to incontinence or sexual dysfunction and things like that. And I got to see, because we had some really great uh, urologists who focused on the more reconstructive aspects of how we help men with these conditions, I got to see how that can really dramatically change someone's quality of life. I mean, when you get a diagnosis of cancer, the focus is really on, you know, we got to cure this cancer, we got to deal with this issue. Uh, but once the cancer is gone, then it's kind of like, okay, now how do we get back to regular life and enjoying a good quality of life. So, although I really enjoyed and still love to do cancer surgery, um, I felt like, you know, I could really connect with these patients that were dealing with some of these issues and chose for that to be my main focus. And now I spend a lot of time treating men with, you know, severe erectile dysfunction after prostatectomy, people that have urinary incontinence, uh, and things like that. So it's very rewarding. Um, and that's part of the reason I enjoy it so much. Awesome. So I guess what I'm referring to yes. is cancer survivorship, which within urology, much of the cancer survivorship work, particularly for cancers that, you know, men get is done by people who specialize in men's health. Yeah. Uh, Esther says, is this like the male version of OBGYN? <laughs> Well, maybe in some ways, um, I, you know, any of us who know men know that men really hate going to the doctor. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty common that I see patients sometimes in their sixties, seventies, who I'm the first doctor they've ever seen. Wow. Um, pr it's primarily usually because they have erectile dysfunction or something else, but by doing a little deeper digging, a lot of times we diagnose them with sleep apnea or with blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, whatever it is. Um, although urology is, you know, definitely a surgical specialty, we definitely get a good mix of both surgical and non-surgical things. So in some ways, I guess we're uh, guy necologists, pun very much intended. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, um, you've, you've never used that one before, I'm sure. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been in my back pocket. Um, but we certainly not just, you know, we in men's health primarily focus on men, but uh, in urology, we see both men and women. Uh, so I do see some women for kidney stones and things like that in my own practice as well, although I primarily see men. Yeah, that's awesome. What is bread and butter for, for the men's health world for you? So I probably have a little bit more of a focus on sexual dysfunction. So for me, it's erectile dysfunction. Uh, and then because it's so common, we all see a ton of BPH and male voiding dysfunction. Mm. Um, so those would probably be the two most common diagnoses I see. I'm also a Peyronie's disease specialist. So I do see a fair amount of that, um, mm. which is also a relatively common condition affecting about up to 10% of men. For somebody who doesn't know what that is, can you explain? Yeah, Peyronie's disease is a scarring condition of the penis that leads to a acquired penile deformity. Uh, so most commonly, we think of this as a penile curvature that somebody develops later in life, uh, but can also affect you know not only the appearance, but also function. It can affect erections and also have pretty devastating effects on a man's own body self-image. Hmm. Interesting. What do you do for that? So there's a wide variety of treatment options available, everything from uh, non-surgical treatments like office-based injections that we can do. Um, there are mechanical therapies like stretching devices and vacuum devices, and there's also a number of different surgeries that we can do uh, to do more of a reconstruction. Wow. So talk about for, for a minute um, the favorite part of your job, Sylvia wants to know. Favorite part of my job is, I have to say, um, when the patient comes in who is really on their last leg, they've given up hope, they've kind of accepted that this is just the way their life is going to be and that there's no going back to the way that it was previously, you know, specifically as it pertains to being able to go out and do stuff if they have severe urinary incontinence or, you know, have intimacy with their partner if they have sexual dysfunction mm. and then being able to restore that function in a relatively quick manner with a surgery, for example. Um, and just seeing, you know, when they come back in for that three month follow up, there's nothing better than, you know, um, getting that pre COVID high five or post COVID air high five from that patient who's just, you know, showing a whole new side of them and smiling and, and things like that, or a lot of times even coming in with their partner who's also giving high fives. Uh, so it's really rewarding, um, you know, in a way that I really enjoy. Yeah. How, how does one get used to the, the conversation around talking about penises all day long and, and sexual function or dysfunction all day long. Uh, what sort of personality does, does better in this field? Well, the first thing I'll say is, you know, if you think back to anatomy lab in medical school, how <laughs> does one get used to being elbow deep in a cadaver all day <laughs> and not being grossed out by it? And I remember, you know, some days being like halfway through and being like, Oh wow, I'm really hungry. You know? How does yeah. one get used to that? So Practice. There's, there's something to say about you could pretty much get used to anything if you yep. do it long enough. Um, I think in general, the people that gravitate towards urology, you have to have a sense of humor. I mean, it, oftentimes in order to break the ice, there needs to be some, you know, light sense of humor involved always within what's appropriate. But, um, and I think like people who like to talk and like to make others feel comfortable talking about some of the more intimate aspects of their life. And this, a lot of this can be learned. I mean, it's not like something that necessarily you're born with, yeah. uh, but part of it is you just spend enough time with people in this specialty and you kind of just absorb, um, you know, the way they talk to patients and how they handle some of these topics. Yeah, definitely. What, are, what does a day in the life look like for you? So I spend about half of my time in clinic seeing patients. And um, I also do a lot of procedures in clinic. And then probably the other half of my 
week is either in surgery or doing other office-based procedures. So office-based procedures, you know, I probably do more than many other specialties because I do a lot of vasectomies and uh, things like that. I do uh, my own penile Doppler ultrasounds for Peyronie's disease and erectile dysfunction. I do a lot of cystoscopy, um, meaning looking inside the bladder in the office, transrectal biopsies. And then in the OR, I'm doing a lot of things like penile prosthesis surgery, uh, artificial urinary sphincters, reconstructive male genital surgery for Peyronie's disease and things like that. Yeah. But because I also do a, a decent amount of general urology, there's kidney stones and, you know, occasional bladder tumors and prostate resections and things like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know who just asked this. Where'd it go? Jessica asks, do you ever see uh, transgender patients? Are you ever doing reconstruction uh, for transgender males? So I am part of our uh, gender affirming surgery program at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we, for the past many years, have primarily done um, vaginoplasty. So male to female transgender surgery. Uh, we are in the process of getting our phalloplasty program up and running. But as you might imagine, that does not happen overnight. So is, that, getting... is, that a, is that a pun? Up up and running? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get it up? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're in the process of, you know, taking the steps towards getting that going as well. But that's something I'll be uh, involved in. My primary role, you know, the, the primary role of people that do what I do, which I do a lot of you know, penile prostheses is um, implanting the neophallus with a penile prosthesis. I have a couple other partners that focus on urethral reconstruction. Um, so, you know, you have to make a new urethra to go out to the end of the neophallus. Um, so that it's a multi-person uh, kind of team-based approach. Uh, so yeah. it's really cool to be involved in that kind of program in its infancy and just kind of help it grow. <laughs> Help, help it grow. No pun intended. Come on, man. You're just setting these up. They're so easy. <laughs> You're all just all about puns. Yes, that, that is awesome. Um, what's, what's your favorite procedure? Great question. I feel like 80 to 90% of my practice is like three different surgeries. And that's kind of the way I always wanted it to be. Because I really, I'm like very meticulous and OCD in that regard. I want to like do everything the best possible way. Um, so I, I do a lot of penile prostheses and some of them are for patients with very complex penile deformities due to Peyronie's disease. So my favorite surgery is placement of a penile prosthesis with simultaneous uh, penile straightening, which sometimes might involve, um, raising up the neurovascular bundle on the top of the penis and getting to that scar tissue underneath, cutting it, and then basically covering that defect with a graft. And we do that all through a little circumcision incision and also place this implant in there. So it's really this just like life altering procedure for many of these guys who can't get an erection anymore. I've, you know, seen guys where their erect penis is like totally bent over like a U on back onto their belly and they can leave the operation with like a totally um, functional and satisfactory appearing wow. penis that is like with basically no scar. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, a couple of people asking what, what causes Peronis is, is it, is it trauma? Is it genetics? So we don't fully understand it, but our best guess is that little micro trauma or microvascular trauma in a person who's predisposed to this condition mm. can lead to this uh, over exuberant or, you know, too much scar formation. And in somebody who can, who has this, or who's predisposed to this, that scar just doesn't go away. It doesn't undergo the normal process of scar remodeling that might in, you know, somebody else's scar tissue or in, even in scar tissue and other parts of that same person's body, for whatever reason, it's kind of confined to the penis. It's associated with Dupuytren's contracture. I was just going to uh, ask that, yeah. Yep, yep. And also later hose disease, which is the same affliction of the foot. Uh, hmm. So not fully understood, an area prime, you know, ripe for further investigation. 
Um, so looking forward to spending my career trying to figure all that out. Yeah. Um, Gabrielle's asking, uh, I think last I heard talking to a female urologist, it's only like 12% or so of urologists are women. Um, are, are there specific barriers in place or is it just historically been male dominated and we, we need to get more women just interested in urology and getting into urology? I think the primary issue is just that it's been a historically male dominated field. Um, we are making great efforts to change that. Um, we at Cleveland Clinic this year for the first time had our first class that was a majority uh, female. Uh, wow. Where I did my residency over a 10 year period, we were one of the only programs that had 50% exactly female residents. Uh, so I think that there are efforts being made to make it a more inclusive specialty, not just for women, but also people of color, et cetera. Um, so although that has been the reality, and if you look at the statistics across the board for the entire, me for example, membership of our major professional society, the American Urological Association, it's still primarily male. But I think that if you look at age groups, you know, the younger urologists, it's certainly not, not close enough yet, but getting closer to 50, 50. Um, as far as barriers, you know, I, I think that everybody that I interact with at, you know, hospitals around the country, everybody is very, very excited that more women and people of color and, you know, people from all backgrounds are coming into urology. I think we desperately need it because we need to have a, a, a you know, a, a group of urologists who are representative of the patients that we're taking care of and treating. And we don't only treat men in urology. We also treat women. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that it's only going to get more and more, you know, uh, balanced over time. For the the female potentially listening to this, for for women in the future who who may be interested in men's health, they just they they're fascinated with that the pathophysiology of men's health and erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease, and that's what they want to get into. Do you see any potential issues with women in in your field specifically with men's health? No, I think my field has unfortunately been one that's been relatively worse than others as far as the number of female uh, residents going into it historically, but I think that's also changing. Um, and many of my close friends in my subspecialty are women and, you know, our fellow next year is a uh, female. Um, you know, if you look at OBGYN, I remember when I rotated on OBGYN, there's always going to be patients that just feel more comfortable talking to somebody of their own sex, uh, but that doesn't mean that you know, you shouldn't pursue it. I think you just have to acknowledge that and recognize that the vast majority of patients do not necessarily have that preference. And in fact, many men that I see much prefer to see female providers. Um, you know, I work very closely with a nurse practitioner who's just amazing. And we kind of share our whole population of patients. <laughs> many of them prefer sometimes seeing her uh, than me. And, it, you know, it's just everybody's different. And, um, you know, um, I, I look forward to in the future having more and more females in this exciting area. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, we need a lot more uh, people to do this kind of stuff because many of these conditions are some of the most common conditions that men deal with. Yeah. For for the future primary care doc out there listening to this, what can you teach them about men's health and, and potential questions to, to talk to their patients about to maybe get them to see you sooner and help them in the long run? Just, you know, uh, make friends with your urologist. They're going to want to make friends with you because um, just getting back to that fact that men, unless that many men, unless they are literally dying, will just not go to the doctor. <laughs> so I think that there needs to be an awareness of this that's shared between urologists and also primary care. Uh, and we need to work together to make sure that when a man comes in for erectile dysfunction, that he is, you know, guided towards a cardiac workup because there's great evidence to show that, you know, 
erectile dysfunction can be the first sign of cardiovascular disease and may precede a heart attack by about five years. Similarly, many men that come in for voiding dysfunction, it may be a consequence of diabetes that they don't know that they have. So I think there's really a lot of opportunities for working together with many of the specialists besides just sending them over for a consult for whatever, but actually closing the loop and having that sort of conversation and say, oh, you know what, this guy you sent over ended up having this, this, and that. It's amazing, you know, how sometimes they can present this way and we end up finding all this other stuff. I think we need to have a you know more holistic view of how we take care of patients and sometimes it's easy in, in, in this day and age when everything everybody is so specialized to kind of have a little tunnel vision and not think about, you know, think outside of the specific organ system you're treating. Hmm. Um, I also see a lot of guys for genital pain, you know, testicular pain and things like that. And it's very common that I diagnose them with, you know, lumbar spinal stenosis or things like that, that it ends up, it's just referred pain coming from some other area. So although it's urology, we try not to just limit our focus to the urologic organs only. Yeah. One of my best friends out here is a sex therapist. Uh, how often do you work with sex therapists to help with erectile dysfunction issues to see if there's something maybe non-physiologic, at least from blood flow and other stuff going on? If I could send every single one of my patients to a sex therapist, I think the world would be a better place. <laughs> Why uh, do you say that? I, we have... we. So, obviously, I see a lot of guys with sexual dysfunction. And... <laughs> Even when the issue is primarily organic in etiology, meaning blood flow problem, there's always some psychological effect, whether that's performance anxiety or, you know, marital strain or anxiety, etc. And it's not even just the sexual dysfunction, guys. I mean, many of these, the pain patients that I see who have had severe testicular pain for years. I mean, they are having a, a huge effect on their life. So I'm a big believer in you know, psychotherapy, sex therapy. You know, thankfully I have somebody I work closely with who does both. So it's kind of like, I just, you know, low threshold to send everybody there. Um, I see a lot of young guys who do not have a, you know, a cardiovascular etiology for their erectile dysfunction. But as I explained to them, I think the brain has overall control over the entire body <laughs> and it can control vascular tone. So if a guy is anxious enough, it can certainly interfere with an erection. I always use the analogy of if you're in the woods and you see a bear, do you get an erection? No. <laughs> no. Because you get a fight or flight response, right? Sympathetic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, on a much smaller scale, a little bit of performance anxiety can have a effect on the, on the vessels. So... We have some approaches we use with oral medications to kind of try to relax the blood vessels a little bit. But along with that, really critically importantly, is that uh, therapy aspect to discuss some of the mental baggage that these men are bringing into a sexual encounter with their partner. Mm -hmm. And we also need to remember to treat the couple as a unit, which is, I think, also one of the unique areas of sexual medicine or the unique factors of sexual medicine is that it really is a unit. I mean, I... I when, when feasible, you know, based on what's going on with social distancing and things like that and the rules in the hospital, but I always try to encourage partners to, or sorry, uh, patients to bring their partners with them, or if we can't meet in person, then virtually to really try to engage both parties and make sure that I get the full story. Because a lot of times, particularly with men, you don't necessarily get the full story just from hearing it from them. It's like, they say one thing and the partner's like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> this is like completely not the issue. Yeah. So, um, uh, where did it go? <clears throat> Ashley had an interesting question. Um, men with spinal cord injuries where there's, there's a spinal cord innervation problem. Do you, do you treat those types of patients and what, oh, yeah. what can you do for them? Yeah. So I did my training in Chicago where I spent like six years working at the biggest VA in at the veterans hospital in Illinois. And we saw a huge number of men with spinal cord injury, they actually had a whole spinal cord unit. And all of these, not all, many men with spinal cord injury have some sort of bladder and often bowel dysfunction. They may have neurogenic bladder. Um, you know, they may also have 
effects of their spinal cord injury on sexual function. So um, a lot of these men, you know, were dealing with catheterization or sometimes even reconstructive surgery for urinary diversions that they can take care of, you know, or, or that their caretakers can take better care of and things like that. So urology, urology has a big area in, um, uh, you know, the care of patients with spinal cord injury. Many call it neurourology, uh, but it's definitely something that we deal with. Less so yeah. in my current practice, but definitely many people like me around the country are doing a lot of it. Interesting. Shannon wants to know for, um, being on call right now, what, what would be a situation where you're called in? Well, I think in about 45 minutes, I'm going to be going to go do a ureteral stent for a obstructing kidney stone in the presence of infection. So if you have an obstructing stone and an infection at the same time, then that's a pretty urgent matter. So that's probably the most common thing that urologists would deal with on call. Beyond that, to be honest, call is really not bad. Um, there, there are many different types of emergencies that can happen, but thankfully, even in a big major academic hospital setting, you know, it's usually not a whole lot. One of the ones we do see because we're a quaternary re referral center, which means that, you know, other big hospitals send their train wrecks to us is Fournier's gangrene, which is like a necrotizing fasciitis of the genitalia. So that requires urgent debridement and resection. For the average urologist, you know, elsewhere on the community, they may not be doing much of that. Uh, and then there's always the penile fractures, uh, priapism or prolonged ischemic erections, things like that that sometimes require operative intervention or, you know, sometimes not. Yeah. Um, the, the training path, we kind of skipped over to become a urologist and become a, a men's uh, health subspecialist, uh, obviously four years of medical school. What is, what is urology residency and, and the fellowship look like for you? So, uh, beyond medical school, you know, uh, the urology residency, about half of urology residencies are five years and half are six years. The ones that are six years include a research year. All of the urology residencies also include an integrated intern year. So that's either, I did a six year uh, residency. And then many urologists who focus on men's health do so straight out of training. You don't necessarily need to have a fellowship, um, particularly if you're planning on community practice or you know, uh, general urology. But if you wanna work at a you know, major academic center and have a focus, then that's when a fellowship is particularly useful, particularly if you didn't get robust training in that area in your residency. Most, uro most urology residencies do a lot of erectile dysfunction and BPH, but for example, some may not do infertility or your much urethral reconstruction, things like that. Um, so uh, there are a couple different types of fellowships that you could do if you wanted to be a men's health specialist there are uh, andrology or infertility fellowships that are primarily focused on microsurgery, like vasectomy reversals and uh, things like that. And these are all one-year fellowships. Then there's a whole separate um, category of fellowships that are uh, reconstructive fellowships. So they focus primarily on urethral and intra-abdominal reconstruction. But along with that, do a lot of um, erectile dysfunction surgery, Peyronie surgery, and things like that. I didn't really feel my interests aligned perfectly with either one of those, so I actually did a fellowship that was kind of somewhere right in between. Um, and it was re it's really primarily a sexual medicine focused fellowship. So we actually have a whole like a professional society, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, that has their own endorsed fellowship. So mine is one of those. So there are varying degrees, you know, some are more infertility heavy, some are more reconstruction heavy, some are more focused on sexual medicine. So the bottom line is there are a lot of different paths that you can take. These are essentially all but a few are one year fellowships. So the shortest path you could have from uh, coming out of medical school to being in practice is either five years if you didn't do a fellowship or six years with a fellowship if you had one of the shorter uh, residency spots.
Okay. Uh, I just put everyone's hand down. If you want to come ask a question, you can do so. Raise your hand. We'll bring you on here. Um, what is what is the world of men's health look like in 10 years? Are we dealing with cool new devices, implants, uh, medications? What what are we looking at in the future? Well, I think I think that um, we're going to have a huge greater and greater influx of patients. And I think part of that is going to come from uh, this increasing utilization of direct to consumer advertised men's digital health platforms like the hymns and the Roman and a lot of these things you see advertised on social media. Um, they're really making a business out of men's propensity to avoid medical care. So um, I think more and more guys are going to have exposure to oral medications. More and more guys are going to fail those medications and then seek help from somebody that can offer more than just, you know, an overpriced pill in the mail. Mm-hmm. Um, in addition to that, as far as technology, I mean, there, there's just constantly evolving technology in urology, uh, particularly as it pertains to, you know, BPH, for example, it's like every year we have some new crazy technology, like stuff that I never did in training that now I can do, a five, you know, five minute in office procedure where I inject steam into their prostate and they have like no pain and go home, you know, the same day and they're awake for it. And like, wow, a couple weeks later, they're already peeing better and avoid surgery. And, you know, there's a lot of the other stuff I do, like the penile <laughs> prostheses, we have, uh, the E E prosthesis coming out that you're able to control from your cell phone. It's just it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Hey Siri. <laughs> and one of the reasons, one of the reasons that I went into urology as a, you know, engineering nerd was that I wanted to have access to the most high tech stuff. I mean, we were one of the first fields that, uh, really, um, incorporated robotic surgery and kind of, uh, mm. Pioneered a lot in that area that has now expanded to other specialties. So it's a really exciting, cutting edge area. And I look forward to all the many opportunities for future innovation. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, do you have a question? Unmute. If you can find it. Hello. There you go. Yeah. All right. How's it going? Good. Good. Um, I had a question. Um, so I, I obviously you um, you specialize in treating men, but are there any conditions that kind of cross over into uh, females that are kind of like you see conditions that are both women and men can experience? Yeah. So you know, before I focused on men's health, I was doing urology. You know. Um, and in urology, we see both men and women. For example, kidney stones, you know, affect both men and women, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, uh, many different conditions. And then we have a whole area of urology called female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, which is kind of like my counterparts in the female side. And they do a lot of uh, office-based and surgical treatments for urinary incontinence, uh, you know, prolapse, fistulas, all sorts of different stuff. So because I'm at a very specialized place where everybody kind of has their niche, I have my focus that deals particularly with men. But going into urology as a you know medical student, you're going to be exposed to both men and women and how to manage all these various conditions. Thanks, Daniel. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Julia. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for being here and talking about, you know, this specialty. I think so many men, you know, are just afraid to talk about their sexual health and everything. Um, I'm actually very interested in reproductive health myself, um, more of like women's reproductive health, but very interested in, um, incorporating like reproductive health education into my career. Um, I feel like this day and age, like so many women are like now realizing, you know, things that they missed out in their sexual health education 
as adolescents in school, um, maybe like birth control accessibility, different types of birth control, self-breast exams, whatnot. Is there something that you feel that young boys should know that should be more like normalized growing up, you know, that they should know coming into their like sexual health age? Man, I, I don't even know where to start because <laughs> our like whole uh, sexual health education, everything is just needs so much work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I see I see a fair number of younger men like 18 to 22 and i try to whenever possible have kind of teachable moments with these guys you know some of the things that i go through with with them just regarding intimacy and expectations and like you know sex is not all about like start penetration and ends when the dude orgasms like you know this is a much more you have to appreciate both partners and the sexual experience of both. And, you know, it's like, I think that a lot of what we learn on TV and through pornography and things like that is just like really setting un- unreasonable and unrealistic expectations of what many of these guys consider to be normal. And it's like so prevalent. Um, so I think there's a lot to do as far as education and awareness at all levels. Uh, we're actually doing a, study now where we're going to be surveying all of the hopefully all of the urology residents around the country to find out what their education has been like as far as how to obtain a uh, sexual health history you know as not just for cisgendered heterosexual patients but also for you know um, men who have sex with men and transgender patients and, and patients from all sorts of different walks of life I I think the answer is going to be obvious that we really don't get any sort of preparation or education for this. So I think we need to be a lot more understanding of the different kinds of people out there in the world and, you know, educate kids and adults as far as, you know, how to be more understanding and open. Right. Right. Thank you for answering my question. Sure. Thanks, Julia. Yeah. Maddie. Hello. Are you able to hear me? Perfect. Um, So I am actually currently a medical device engineer in a prosthetic urology branch of a company. So um, I actually work on a lot of these devices and I do really enjoy sort of the technology aspect of them. So what relationship do you have with a lot of this sort of technology development and research that is going on? So I, before I, went to med school. I was, uh, I went to school for biomedical engineering. So I've like always kind of been a tech nerd and like totally hyper analyze everything and try to figure out how to make it better. Um, so I think a lot of people like hate that about me, but it's probably a good thing. (laughs) Um, so, you know, I, I maintain a good relationship with all of the device companies for the products that I use. And I very, openly and regularly provide feedback about things that I think are worthy of trying to improve. Um, My basic science research that I'm involved in is looking at biofilms on implanted um, prosthetic devices and how we can better engineer coatings to prevent biofilm formation. Uh, So there's a lot of opportunities through both research and just, you know, uh, in a more day-to-day clinical practice working with device companies to try to make better devices. Uh, so whenever there's, you know, new stuff coming out, I'm always involved in the booth at the conferences where they're kind of showing what's new and getting feedback and things like that. So definitely a lot of exciting work being done and, and more to come. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. Maddie, have you looked into Carl, Illinois College of Medicine? I have not, but I will have to add that to my list. I'm pretty Code. early in. Yeah. Go, go look at them. Uh, cause they are an engineering based medical school. About 80% of their, um, of their students have some sort of biomedical engineering background or are coming from non-traditional, uh, paths where they've been working as engineers. So might be something you're, you're interested in. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, you should look at their, their 
their stuff, Peter, as a biomedical engineer background and all your, your tech uh, interests, they, their curriculum is just, it's phenomenal. They're, they're looking to create physicians who are kind of like you, who just, they come into medical school and all they think about are the engineering models of, of kind of pathophysiology and how can we develop new stuff? I'm, I'm sure it's part of their like curriculum. Uh, although I did talk to them, like if, if you create something there, like you get access to it as the patent holder. So they're, they're not taking your money, um, but it's, it's really cool. Jonathan. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, you kind of made the point that the brain is kind of in control ultimately. So how is, um, I guess, mental health, um, been kind of a focus in your in your study or your work? Great question. Um, I would say that the average urology training and um, practice is not super focused on the mental health aspect. I think like part of the reason that I was drawn to what I do is because there is a significant mental health component. And um, many of the conditions that I see and treat do have a big psychological toll and an perhaps an association with other um, mental health conditions like, you know, anxiety, depression, ADHD, etc. Mm -hmm. I actually had like a really awesome psychiatry rotation experience where I felt like I really learned a lot. And I never really thought that I wanted to make a career out of it, but I definitely thought that I kind of was more passionate about it than many people that chose a surgical specialty. So Although it's not something I, I would say we get formal training in, I never had to do any psych rotations or anything like that during uh, training. I think it's definitely an asset in this type of subspecialty. And I think that, you know, no matter what your personality is, no matter what your interests are, a field like urology is so broad that you can really find an area that allows you to have the type of practice and, and things like that that you want to use the skills that you want to use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Sylvia asks, if you could go back and, and talk to your pre-med self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, God, don't listen to your pre-med advisor. I hate to say that, but I had like a really bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I say that all the time, although I, I, I have to be nicer oh, to pre-med advisors because they're not all bad. Uh, luckily, well, they're not all I, bad. Yeah, no, I think it was a unique scenario and maybe just some confusion because I had a, I had a unique major. I didn't have biology or, you know, biology at all as part of my curriculum. So I was told that my biomedical engineering classes would suffice for medical school and all that. And it turned out that was true for that institution's medical school. But then when yeah. I applied and places were like, you didn't take biology, we're not even going to look at your application. <laughs> it ended up, I mean, all things, listen, all things, no matter what happens, end up working out for some reason. I truly believe that. I mean, like there are so many times at various stages of my career where I was like, so upset that something didn't work out a different way. But at the end of the day, things happen for a reason you're going to end up where you're meant to end up and like, you know, just try not to get too down on yourself about little individual things that might happen in the way. But that's what I would say. Love it. Love it. Um, I'm going to end it there. Nobody. Oh, wait, there's one more person. All right, Vivian, Vivian, we'll bring Vivian. She, she just raised her hand. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll end it and you can go on and do some procedures and have some fun. So, some people want to know if they could, uh, if you could, tape your phone to your chest and bring us into your procedure. <laughs> uh, there may be some person in legal that doesn't want me to do that, <laughs> but if it were up to me, I would love to. <laughs> uh, yes. What, one day we'll, in this COVID world, we'll allow that sort of true virtual shadowing <laughs> with the patient's consent, of course. Indeed. Um, all right. We'll wait for Vivian. Takes a couple seconds to get her on. We'll let her come on. Let me see if there's any other good questions here. Tressie uh, loves your mannerisms and way of speaking. It's clear and understandable. So, oh, good. Thank thought you. you should know that. I only bring on the best for you all. Come on. <laughs> that's, that's my goal. Oh, here's a, here's a question while, while Vivian is joining right now. Um, for 
for future osteopathic physicians, do you see any sort of obstacles for them to come into urology and men's health? You know, unfortunately, just this is just across the board statement that urology is one of the more competitive specialties. And although I think overall places across the border becoming more inclusive and interested in taking osteopathic candidates, I think unfortunately to some degree in this country, there's a historical barrier for many osteopathic candidates to get into allopathic programs. Now there are osteopathic urology residencies, you know, many of my friends trained at those, um, but it, it, it may be competitive just like it is for all candidates. Um, but I would just encourage you to get exposed to as many people and programs as possible and do all the things that you need to do to make your um, resume as good as possible. And th that basically boils down to three categories. One is your academic performance. Two is your leadership, uh, you know, showing your leadership potential by being involved in things and leadership positions. And number three is service back to your community. Those are all things that I think are important for all applicants at all levels um, to try to show to some degree. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Reed asked, what step score would be good for going into urology? Step one scores are gone, but yeah. step two scores no I'm clue. Sure will be I'm there. Like, so I'm like far enough now past that point that so my, nice, huh? my knowledge about this is totally not even helpful to you. Yeah. I, I wish it was, but you got to ask around the people that just recently went through it. They're going to be the best, uh, most yeah. able to answer those questions for you. But starting next year, step one is pass fail. I don't know if you knew that. Exactly. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Vivian. All right. One, one question. We'll, we'll head out. Hello there. Hello. Thank you for choosing me. So I was just wondering if there's a typical age group of men who have um, infertility issues that you see, or is it just all different ages? Well, I think that in general, fertility patients are of a particular age group, you know, so the youngest that we see are probably mid to mid twenties. And then, you know, we see people into their forties, sometimes later. Uh, infertility is also just like sexual dysfunction. It's a couple's condition. So you need to have an evaluation and assessment and management of both partners. So there are a lot of different variables. So I wouldn't say there's necessarily an age group that's uh, specific, but I will say that the older the couple is, both partners included, the more likely they're going to have difficulty. Uh, but for a wide variety of factors, you know, sometimes less common things like Klinefelter syndrome and things like that, even younger couples may be seeing us. I don't, although I trained in infertility, I don't currently see infertility as part of my practice because we're so subspecialized that two of my partners, that's like the primary focus of what they do. So we regularly talk about cases and, and whatnot, but it's not a, a big part of the patients I see right now. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Vivian. All right. Dr. Peter Bayich, thank you so much for coming on, hanging out with us for a little bit. I'm glad uh, no emergency is taking, <laughs> yes. away, uh, taking you away from us tonight. So I have 304 students on with us tonight hearing about men's health subspecialty of urology. So thank you again for coming on and sharing your knowledge. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, man. Hey, everyone, have a great night. We'll see you later. Bye. Take care.